All right, let's talk about the rules of chemical naming. So chemical naming is the idea that you should be able to look at a formula and be able to come up with a name for it, or look at any given chemical name and be able to come up with a formula for it. And these chemical naming rules are how we're going to approach that. So this is just an overview of the ways you go through the process of dealing with how to come up with a name for something, something that's summarized in a little handout like this. Um, when looking at the chemicals you're going to come across in this class, essentially they fall into three categories. These chemicals are either ionic, molecular, molecular also being called uh, non-ionic, and the third type you're going to come across is acids. So each one of these has its own naming rules. And the, aside from not knowing the naming rules, the other common issue people have is using the wrong rules for the wrong formulas. So it's very important to recognize which of these categories a chemical formula um, matches with in order to even be able to use the right rules. So with ionic, molecular, and acids, let's go through how you recognize one of each of them. An ionic compound is either going to be metal and non-metal, or it contains a polyatomic ion. So it, Ionic compound either contains a metal and a nonmetal or a polyatomic ion somewhere in the formula. So a metal and a nonmetal, like for example, sodium chloride, if we look at sodium on the periodic table, it's a metal. Chlorine's a nonmetal. In fact, honestly, if there's metal in the chemical formula, you can bet it's probably an ionic compound. A polyatomic ion, that'd be, for example, like NH4Cl, which would be a polyatomic ion plus a nonmetal. There's no metals present, but nonetheless, even though it's all nonmetals, because there's a polyatomic ion present, you'd say this is an ionic compound. Here, non-ionic compounds are non-metals only, and then um, I should say an example being like uh, maybe CO2. That's one people are generally pretty familiar with. Carbon's a nonmetal, oxygen's a nonmetal, non-ionic molecular compound. So uh, let's see, acids, you can recognize an acid because typically, and there are exceptions, but typically the chemical formula starts with H. I suppose I should be a little more technical. The chemical formula starts with hydrogen. Now. Um, Examples of this would be like HCl. Maybe I should write that a little bigger. So examples of acids would be like HCl or HNO3 or HNO2 or HCN. All acids, notice what they have in common. Molecular, I suppose, again, is CO2 would be a good example. Um, let's see, and maybe I can throw out some other examples that'll kind of be useful. Let's see, maybe, I'm not even sure if this is a real compound, but one nitrogen, one fluorine, two nitrogens and a fluorine, a nitrogen and two fluorines. I don't know if those are real compounds or not, but they'll make the point for when it comes to the rules of how to name them later. So there's some examples of molecular compounds. Examples of ionic compounds, sure, I guess I'll rewrite these down here. NaCl, NaNO3, and, and there's others to come, but I think that kind of gives you a place to start. In fact, actually, I need to start by talking about these bits right here with the uh, ionic compounds. And the reason why is because, uh, there you go, adjust to make sure that everything I'm going to do is visible. When it comes to considering ionic compounds, you have to deal with the fact that ionic compounds contain metals, 
and the formula of the compound is determined by the charge of a metal. And that gets kind of messy depending on which metals you're dealing with. Here's why. When you look at the periodic table, you have certain metals, like the alkali and the alkaline earth metals, where you know the charge. Like all the alkaline metals are plus one, alkaline earth are all plus two. Silver is a plus one, zinc is a plus two. So that makes it easy. If I say zinc and chlorine, for example, zinc chloride, you can come up with a formula. What if I say like iron and chlorine bound together? Well, the iron is one of those transition metals where the charge can vary. There is an iron plus one, iron plus two, iron plus three. And because it can be multiple different things, you have to specify which one it is. So you can have different forms of iron chloride and you need to specify which kind using a Roman numeral. So what I'm gonna say here is you've got two kinds of ionic compounds. You're gonna have ionic compounds with metals with variable charge Or you can have the kinds with metals with constant charge. And there's a slightly different set of naming rules for this compared with this. So for metals with a variable charge, we're talking like, say, iron and anything, let's say chlorine. let's say maybe an iron plus three chlorines. What you have to do is figure out what the charge of the iron is and then add a Roman numeral. So this would actually be iron three chloride. Now, what does the Roman numeral represent? It does not represent this three. The Roman numeral three says iron with the charge of plus three and chlorine. As in, if I saw this, what I would do is now let's say iron, three plus charge, chlorine, look it up on the periodic table, it's a minus one. You switch the charges to say that there's one iron and three chlorines in the formula. That's why it's FeCl3. It's a result of iron having a plus three charge. So, Roman numerals are for the metals with variable charges. And you can do this with various things. This is a separate video for practice. You can look at that separately to see more examples of this. But essentially, for ionic compounds with metals that have a variable charge, the name is always going to have the name of the metal, a Roman numeral telling you what the metal's charge is, and then the other thing. And I suppose I could do one other example just to emphasize that this is not the same as this, necessarily. Uh, I guess maybe I'll pick iron again, but this time I'll have it with two oxygens. So in this case, it's not iron two oxide. I would have to say, okay, the oxygen is a charge of, and actually I'll write this down here so I can show this process more clearly. Oxygen's a minus two charge. There's two of them, that's a total of minus four. Therefore, the iron must balance it out by being a plus four because you can't have a net charge. However much negative it is, there must be the same amount of positive charge. So the name of this would be iron, Roman numeral four, oxide. Iron four oxide. So again, this represents the charge of the iron, not the number of other things attached to it. So, that's the summary of that. Metals without constant charge, or sorry, metals with constant charge don't need a Roman numeral. Roman numeral is for the metals with variable charge only. So this is going to be, for example, sodium, which is an alkali metal. Chloride, that's sodium chloride. No Roman numeral needed, just sodium chloride. You just say exactly what's there, sodium chloride. And even, it doesn't matter how many there are. So for example, if I have sodium with S, 
let's see, S has a charge of minus two, sodium is a plus one. So the correct formula has one sulfur and two sodium. So Na2S1, Na2S would simply be called sodium sulfide. Okay, so this number does not change the naming. Even if it's a polyatomic ion, what if I did Na2SO4? That just makes it sodium sulfate. As opposed to this, if I use iron, I'd, if I had iron paired with sulfate, I'd have to have iron, some Roman numeral, and then sulfate in the name. So just make sure Roman numerals for variable charge only. Okay, so that's for ionic compounds. Now, molecular compounds. Molecular compounds use the Greek prefixes to tell you what's there. So, what you do is you would look at this and you would say carbon dioxide. Nitrogen monofluoride. Notice how um, all these second ones, it's I, fluoride, oxide, you know, whatever, because the negatively charged thing goes at the end, the positively charged thing goes at the beginning. So this is the cation, so carbon dioxide. And I suppose, let me uh, make a point here. Suppose you had this. This would be called fluorine. mononitride, right? So whichever one's first is just the name and the second one ends in ide. So just be aware of that as you work with these sorts of things. Never use mono for the first one, but always use mono for the second one if there's just one. Never use mono for the first one if there's just one. Now if there's two, now this is dinitrogen monofluoride. Or here we have nitrogen difluoride. So these Greek prefixes, di, mono, whatever, are for non-ionic only. And you make sure you're familiar with mono meaning one, di meaning two, tri meaning three, tetra meaning four, etc. It's all on the it's all on the list. So that's your quick overview of molecular non-ionic naming rules. Now for acids. The name of an acid is determined by the structure and the name, and by partly of the name of what's in the acid, and partly by the structure, what it contains or doesn't contain. So acids that contain oxygen are named differently from acids that do not contain oxygen. So for acids that do contain oxygen, whether it's a polyatomic ion or not, Let's see, I should say, um, let me see, where's another one? Actually, I know I think about it, the ones that contain oxygen typically are polyatomic ions anyway. So maybe I'll start with the ones that do not contain acid. Some are polyatomic ions, some are not. So that's not a polyatomic ion, this one is. This is cyanide. So the way you name it is based on what's in there, but because there's no oxygen, the name of the acid is not only based on what's in there, but also starts with hydro. Anytime you see a formula with no oxygen in it, and it fits an acid, the name's gonna start with hydro. This is hydrochloric acid. I need to come around and make sure that that's on screen. Yes, it is, okay. This is hydrocyanide. So this is cyanide right here, so it becomes hydrocyanic acid. Cyanide becomes cyanic. Let's see, and you can do the same thing with other ones, like HBr becomes hydrobromic acid. Or H3P is hydrophosphoric acid. On the other hand, if they do contain oxygen, they do not start with hydro. 
Instead, you look at the name of what's inside to determine how to call it. So for example, this is nitrate. Obviously, that's not the name of the acid. I'm just showing you how where it comes from. This polyatomic ion is nitrite. And what you do is you look at the name of the polyatomic ion, and that determines how you name the acid. So because this ends in 8, you call it, it turns into nitric acid. Because this ends in it, it becomes nitrous acid. Like that. So it becomes ic. Let's see, um, it becomes us. So nitric acid, nitrous acid. So consider H3PO4. This is phosphate. Eight takes the ic ending. I, I've heard it said that if you ate an acid, you would say ic. There you go, maybe that helps. Um, phosphoric acid is going to be the name of this because phosphate is the name of this polyatomic ion. So if you ate an acid, you would say ic. Except, unfortunately, this one doesn't quite follow the rules, so phosphoric acid, but unless it will have ic in the name. And that's the correct name of this particular compound, phosphoric acid. And others are going to follow the same pattern. So uh, let's see, actually, let me change these to another one so I can show you just yet another example. So instead of those ones, actually, I can make it, actually, no, I'll leave that as that. I'll change it to SO3, and I'll change this to SO4. This is sulfite. This is sulfate. Or this contains sulfate. Because of H, you know it's going to be an acid. So if you ate an acid, you would say ic. But uh, we got to add just a little bit more on. So it's tempting to say sulfic acid, but technically say sulfuric acid. Again, if you ate an acid, you would say ic. So sulfate becomes ic. Sulfite becomes that us acid. So I, it becomes us. So sulfurous acid. And that essentially is the rules for naming in a nutshell. And here it is for it with the acids again. If it contains oxygen, it does not start with hydro. No oxygen, name starts with hydro. And if it has these polyatomic ions, polyatomic, polyatomic ions ending in it have an us name for the acid. Polyatomic ions ending in eight have an ic name for the acid. So there's the overall view of the chemical naming rules.